I will talk on the microphone just very, very briefly. Um, uh, I will introduce... Oh, I'm going to e introduce Lisa Vargo. Spectacular. Um, this is a great book, by the way, that uh, Essie has written. Um, it has been nominated for a sleuth of awards in Canada and abroad and overseas. Uh, it made the shortlist for the Orange Prize for Fiction, uh, the Booker Prize in Canada. Uh, accolades included nominations for the Governor General Liter Literacy Award for Fiction and the Rogers Writers Trust Prize for Fiction. And of course, it won the Scotiabank Giller Prize, uh, which is one of the largest literary awards uh, we, we have in Canada. So uh, we're absolutely delighted to have uh, Essie here. And uh, I would love to now invite uh, my friend and colleague, that she is also the head of the English department, Dr. Dr. Lisa Vargo, to come up and say a few words. Good evening, and thanks, Dean. Uh, as Dean said, my name is Lisa Vargo. I'm the head of the English department, and I want to welcome you this evening to My Writing Life, a joint venture of the MFA in Writing, the Department of English, the Interdisciplinary Center for Culture and Creativity, in partnership with the College of Arts and Science, and this year with the Department of Music. I also want to acknowledge the Jazz Festival, the Saskatoon Jazz Society, and the Saskatoon Public Library for their support with book club events. And something new tonight, we're live streaming this event. So hi, everybody out there uh, watching this online. We have students from all over the world who couldn't be here tonight and all over the province. And they're watching this online at www.artsandscience.usask.ca backslash SE Live backslash. Thank you to the Center for Continuing and Distance Education for the sponsorship of live streaming. And this year, we've expanded this event to include all of our regional colleges. Regional college students have been reading the book, along with students, faculty, and staff on our main Saskatoon campus. And they've had their own mini book club meetings. So if you're watching online, you can tweet your questions for SE using hashtag SELive during the presentation. And as I welcome our audience in Quant's Theatre tonight, I want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is Treaty 6 territory and the traditional Métis homeland. And we acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose footsteps have marked this territory for centuries. So, about tonight's lecture. The idea for my writing life arose as many good ideas do when the conditions are right. It was a sunny summer afternoon, and the head of English, the director of the MFA in writing, and the associate director for the ICCC were sitting on the deck at Louis' pub, thinking about how we could bring a distinguished writer to the U of S. And there might have been one or two invigorating beverages involved to stimulate our imaginations. From that meeting of minds came the idea for our event that a writer of national stature would be invited to offer a public lecture. It would be different from the more usual author reading. The writer would reflect on issues like his or her craft, the state of publishing, or a retrospective look at a writing career. It was important that the talk be of interest to the community, while also providing an opportunity for MFA and writing students seeking professional development to engage with a renowned writer along with faculty and graduate and undergraduate students and staff who are readers of the author's works. Our inaugural speaker in 2012 was Sharon Butala. In 2013, Wise Minds decided that it would be advantageous to join My Writing Life with the annual Arts and Science Book Club, whose first book was Yann Martel's Life of Pi. The two events joined with Ross King's Leonardo and The Last Supper, 
as the book club choice, followed by King's talk on how he came to be a writer. And actually, we helped him become a writer because he applied for a job in our department and didn't get it. Uh, so, uh, and he then became a world-renowned uh, writer uh, with film deals. So I feel very proud of that. Uh, anyway, uh, last year Joseph Boyden's Three Day Road was the book club choice, and of course uh, he also gave a talk. But about tonight's speaker, tonight I am delighted to introduce Essie Adutin. Essie Adugin was born in Calgary and educated at the University of Victoria and Johns Hopkins University, and now lives in Victoria with her husband and two children. Uh, as you've uh, heard uh, uh, from Dean and previously today, her novel Half-Blood Blues has received many awards, including the Scotiabank Giller Prize, the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize, the Hurston Wright Le Legacy Award, and it was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize in the UK, uh, the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction in Canada, and the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, among other awards. Uh, her debut novel, The Second Life of Samuel Tyne, was published in 2004 and also nominated for the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. And it was chosen by the New York Public Library as one of 2004's books to remember. Her writing has appeared in several anthologies, including Best New American Voices and Revival, an anthology of black Canadian writing. Adujan has, has held fellowships in the United States, Scotland, Iceland, Hungary, Finland, Spain, Belgium, and Germany. Her most recent work, published in 2014, is a book of nonfiction entitled Dreaming of Elsewhere, Observations on Home, a meditation on identity, culture, and belonging. And it's based on her 2013 Henry Kreisel Memorial Lecture, sponsored by the Canadian Literature Center. This is an inspiring career, though the story uh, that Essie told earlier today, uh, and probably tells from time to time, uh, is that even uh, uh, in this world of commercial publishing, uh, success for even a wonderfully talented writer like Essie Adugin can arise from strange moments of grace, as she puts it. Her success demonstrates how you need to believe in what you've written and keep hammering away to get your writings published. I want to close by offering this insight from Essie that's captured in an interview for the college that's posted on the college website. And I just love this so much. Remind yourself daily that writing is a joy and a privilege and nothing matters but words. You are in it for the words. It is that simple. You are in it to explore and challenge through language. We are looking forward to hearing words that matter from you tonight. Please join me in welcoming Essie Adugin. Thank you, Professor Vargo, for that wonderful introduction. That was really lovely. And I'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences for hosting this event this evening. OK, I won't touch that. Uh, in particular, the MFA writing program and the Department of English and um, the ICCC as well. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, can I just say a big, huge thank you to Professor McNeil and the jazz ensemble that just played. Like, what, a, what a privilege to hear live music. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, I guess I'll just start by telling you a very quick story about um, my trip here. And uh, a very funny thing happened. And I know that line is such a cliche, but Bear with me. Uh, so I took two planes to get here, and the first one was a short flight from Victoria to Vancouver. And it's, you know, it's relatively uneventful most of the time. Uh, but we landed in Vancouver, and um, it was a bit of a foggy day, but otherwise, you know, pretty, pretty standard West Coast weather. 
And um, after we landed, the flight attendant went and wheeled down the staircase. And, and then all of a sudden, the, um, one of the air traffic control guys rushed in and whispered something to her. And then her, you know, all of the blood drained from her face. And she turned and she started banging on the cockpit door and hammering on it. And the pilot opened it. And she hissed something at him, didn't quite catch it. And then she turned to everybody in the cabin and said, OK, everybody, you've got to get out immediately. Leave your stuff. Just get out of, the, get out of here. And we thought, OK. So people are you know, dashing out. And they, you know, they've got their coats have been left behind. You know, people are running out in their socks. And, you know, we're on the, the tarmac, and she says, what are you doing? Why are you stopping? Like, keep going. Get into the building. Like, so we're all dashing, and, um, you know, and, and then finally we get in there, and we're waiting for, for the explosion or whatever is going to happen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the fire trucks rush onto the tarmac, and there are, like, 20 guys wearing yellow vests, and everybody's scrambling around, and we think, oh, what's going to happen? And, and mercifully, you know, nothing happened. It was very, very silent. But I just, um, you know, I thought, you know, I, I still got on the next plane here. So I thought that shows dedication. That shows you exactly how much I wanted to be here tonight. I said I was willing to take another flight after that fiasco. So my topic tonight is the writing life. And I'll just dive right in. Ask any writer. The answer is surely, what life? The German poet Rainer Maria Rilke described the life of the artist as being like a shriveled limb during the months of creation. As for me, I don't know. Are there writers out there whose lives actually survive the all obliterating assault of a novel, a book of poems, stories? For me, writing has often entailed not having a life or rather, leading a kind of shadow life in which everything else withers and pales and fades away while you blot out every sound but the clacking of the computer keys. The question I am asked most routinely is, do you write with a pen or on a computer? Pleasant enough. But I was asked this last month at a talk in Halifax, and I paused. The query seemed suddenly of enormous significance. What sort of person scratches down their thoughts? And what sort of person pecks out their words on a keyboard? What essential traits of one's nature are exposed by each method? Now, you can see how neurotic writers are in their weighing of such questions. You ask them why they prefer recycled paper, and they break out in hives. <laughs> in this case, Silence fell between me and my questioner. It was as if time had stopped and we had gone back to the beginning of all creation. Meeting his eye, I cleared my throat. Both, I said. Well, that ought to cover it. <laughs> as a writer, I gather such stories, even these small ones. I do not even realize that I'm doing it, but so it is. I find it out when I settle down to write when, with the spontaneity of a crash, people reemerge in my mind, dragging with them the baggage that made them so memorable, the stories. I used to keep notebooks, penning quick sketches of all the odd people I met for possible later use. I stopped doing this when I realized that those notebooks never got reopened. I prefer now to let the absurdities settle, to forget them almost. What an astonishing pleasure when, typing furiously, I am met again by the gestures of some real-life character, the words of some ridiculous drifter. When people come back to me in all their idiosyncratic majesty, it has the luster of a chance meeting in the street. Sometimes, in the best of circumstances, it can even feel like a homecoming. Now, this is not to say that I write straight from life. I have several writer friends who do this, and I find nothing wrong with it, or so I am broad-minded enough to believe until they start writing about me. <laughs> One of my closest friends, an exquisite short story writer whose cold, beautifully phrased, beautifully phrased pieces have something of the delicacy of origami, 
has an impossible time with invention. I don't know how anyone makes anything up, she says. I can only write what I have lived, and it drives my father crazy. She told me of a story in which she had taken a painful family incident, the remarriage of her paternal grandfather, and depicted it with blistering honesty, using actual names, because, as she felt, in what seems like a modern paraphrase of Shakespeare, I did not feel that Rose could be anything but a Rose. Her name really gets at the essence of who she was. It was only when threatened with being disowned that she changed the name to Violet. <laughs> but what is a Violet, she grumbled. Just some weed-like flower that you walk past on the way to pick the real flowers. Now a rose, that's something. A rose is so intricate, so beautiful, and the last thing it wants is to be picked. All those thorns. My rose, Grandma Rose, was like that. Every time you tried to get close to her, you came away bleeding. I hoped when she said this that we were still speaking in metaphor. And though I am careful not to, and really have no interest in writing wholly from life, I can well sympathize with wanting to get the most out of the, out of the metaphorical resonance that a name can have. My own characters are composites, which is to say that they are pieced together from the people around me, both those I chance to meet once and those with whom I share long-standing ties. But they are also partly ghosts of other literary characters, the results of thought experiments, pieces of my own personality, or sudden whims or ideas that occur to me while banging out sentences. I would never be able to pinpoint exactly which process gave birth to which character. But I am satisfied that no one could ever point to a single one of my characters and rightfully utter, that is me. At least I was so satisfied until last month. At that same talk in Halifax, during the question segment, a shyly smiling young man rose from the audience and in an eloquent, slanted accent, asked about the reception of Half-Blood Blues in Germany. After I explained that, mercifully, the book had gone over well, he began to tell me of his origins. Just like my main character in that novel, Hieronymus Falk, the man's mother was from Cologne, his father from Cameroon. They had met, like Falk's parents in that region, fallen quickly in love. I do not know if reading the novel from so unnerving a vantage point made him skeptical of it. He was too polite to offer criticism. As its author and Falk's creator, I felt terribly haunted by this man's presence, the proverbial hairs standing at the back of my neck. Our meeting had the feel of something coming full circle, an act of fate. This same sense of inevitability was at play when it came to naming Falk. Setting out to write the novel, I had no idea that the vulnerable, brilliant young jazz man that I was getting to know would be called Hieronymus. It was a name that I associated only with the Dutch painter Hieronymus Bosch, and there is something so grotesque and, thankfully, inimitable about Hieronymus Bosch that his name creates a kind of scorched earth around it, a devastating wasteland that almost repels you. And yet, sitting down to write the first line of dialogue my character would speak, the name sprang up like some unearthly weed that refused to be pried out. The name is both faintly ridiculous and utterly apt, both ugly and sibilant with its lack of hard consonants. But it had the jazz-like tones of Thelonious Monk, which I liked. That kinship seemed to grant an instant authenticity to Falk's musical calling. I even came to like the way his bandmates could abbreviate it to Hero. The name a metaphor, an echo of his central place in the story. It was absolutely fitting. A Hieronymus by any other name. 
The creation of his character was something of a new process for me. I have often been asked why he feels like the palest of the three main characters, the others being Sid Griffiths and Chip Jones, when in fact he sits at the heart of the narrative, the pivotal figure, the person whose fates the others orbit. And it is true that at the center of it all is this tiny, young, unknowable runt, sullen, brilliant, and giving so little of himself beyond the genius of his music. This was done for several reasons. To my thinking, genius is an unquantifiable thing. It goes beyond natural gifts to an innate aptitude that cannot be explained. It is at its heart mysterious, its origins without a clear source. So in this way, Hero is a physical manifestation of his talent, unmistakably there, but impossible to quantify, a living enigma, what my colorfully spoken uncle would call a tough customer. The other reason for taking a step back from him, for seeing him from a distance, through the lens of Sid's voice, was one of respect. In researching the experience of Afro-Germans throughout history, and in particular in the Second World War, I felt that to, that to tell the story from the inside, as it were, disingenuous. It is not my particular history. Though I do not believe that only those who share a history or a cultural background with a certain subject matter are the sole people who get to write about it. With respect for dissenting opinions, I have never understood appropriation of voice to be the unthinkable crime that some others have made it out to be. As long as it is rooted in the desire to understand, writing about another's culture can be an act of compassion. It is simply an extension of what all writing is, the entering of another's reality in an attempt to feel what they feel, think what they think. It is a triumph of empathy. That said, I wanted readers to feel for Hero without having to understand every nuance of his mind. I did not want to trample on his status as an enfant sauvage. I hoped that some degree of compassion for his struggles could exist without having to unbrick the wall of his mystery. I will admit that I wanted it both ways. It was the choice I felt best served the story. And beneath it, too, was my feeling that maybe a head-on exploration of that historical legacy, the grappling with how black people have been treated in Germany throughout the ages, is better left to someone with a greater stake in it. This is not to say someone more culturally qualified. Again, the appropriation of debate, the appropriation of voice debate holds no water with me, but rather someone with a strong desire to tell the story of it more purely without the adulterations and concerns of foreign characters. This could be an Englishman. This could be a German. It could be that young man standing sheepishly at the podium on a cold evening in Halifax, asking an author how his countrymen reacted to seeing their history suddenly retold through the lens of a kid like him, how it felt to see him at the center. Gustave Flaubert's advice to writers was to be, quote, regular and orderly in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. While this is not always possible, I'm happy for the tip. It is certainly preferable to the opposite. I do not think there is a writer alive who doesn't struggle with how to balance laundry with line breaks. It is the age-old quandary the bete noire at the heart of our business, as old as the pen. Here's the core of the problem. Like other professions, it is essential to maintain a schedule, to be, as Flaubert said, as regular and as orderly about it as possible. Unlike other professions, though, writing is a vocation. 
It resists every attempt to wrestle it into a schedule, the words and thoughts bubbling up when you least expect them. You feel, at times, like the receptacle for some brutally sudden knowledge, like an oracle, or like a teenager in a sexual education class. You are having a perfectly respectable day when out of the blue this thing gets dropped on you, and you are filled with wonder or shock at the awful otherworldliness of it. You want to tell everyone, which in the writer's case means writing it down. Life doesn't always lend itself to these sudden attacks. Too often you are in the car, or at a sport ball game, or chatting affably at one of those school family potlucks where you're the only one who hasn't brought a dish afflicted with marshmallows. <laughs> the mundane takes over. Like a fire blanket thrown over sparks, all the points of light get dimmed, and you are left with the memory of a fleeting brightness. I find this ironic, the triumph of life over writing. For isn't life the very thing that writing is meant to capture? Don't we write in order to reflect on life, to parse it, to attempt to make sense of a shared experience that is at its base unfathomable, miraculous, and completely beyond any logic? And yet they continue to battle each other, as if designed to cancel each other entirely. Perhaps there are some for whom there is not this struggle. A conversation with any group of female writers can lead you to believe that this is solely, solely a woman's issue. But I do not think so. Fathers, the involved ones, that is, like my husband, who is also a writer, fret as much about this balance as anyone else. Routine is an equal opportunity destroyer. The tethers are ever there. We have made a pact in our house, a pact to keep each other on the straight and narrow, which really involves just making sure that we, keep, that we each keep bankers' hours. Well, the hours that bankers used to keep before the public got so irate and demanded that they open their doors on Saturdays. Every morning around 7.30, my husband and I wake the kids and start getting ready for the day. I say wake up. It is better described as being slapped into consciousness like a newborn. My daughter, who is big for her four years and full of energy, rushes in 15 minutes before our alarm goes off to jump on our heads. By this time, she has lain restlessly awake in her bed for an hour. And as punishment for having made her wait, she beats us senseless. It is a miracle that we have a shred of intelligence left to write with. We haven't been concussed yet, but she is ambitious. <laughs> Recently, I read in the newspaper that a concerned patron made a formal complaint to the Toronto Public Library that Dr. Seuss's hop on pop promotes parental abuse. <laughs> I have removed the offending title from my daughter's shelves, but to no avail. We also have a 10-month-old boy and I think of him not so much as my son, but as a terrorist in training. <laughs> you can see the gleam in his huge brown eyes as he watches his sister land on us. Just you wait, he seems to say. I will crush you like a stack of falling dictionaries. <laughs> the four of us then have breakfast, which is to say that my daughter has breakfast while I sit there shoving spoonfuls of offensive smelling rice cereal into my son's mouth and behind us, my bleary-eyed husband rushes around muttering about coffee and dropping grapes as he fumbles together a lunch for our daughter. She attends a preschool, and among her clique of screeching girls, it is in vogue to one-up each other. I can run faster than you, she tells me between bites. Okay. I can travel to the moon and back and get my hair cut to my shoulders before you. Eat your Cheerios, love. Then either my husband or myself, we alternate days, gathers up the children and drives off to my daughter's school. We return half an hour later and play with the baby. In his earliest months, we split the days. One person wrote 
while the other looked after him, only to trade off at lunchtime. Now that he is a little bit bigger, we are blessed to have a babysitter. And so for five hours of each weekday, we settled down in our respective offices to write. Our course did not always run this smoothly. My husband used to teach and was for 10 years a sessional instructor at the local university. My own tenure there was a much briefer affair. I simply had no passion for teaching. We did odd jobs to support ourselves, jobs I pray to God I'll never have to do again. But it was worth it in the end, and if anything, it has given us the sense of being uniquely blessed. Getting to focus only on your writing all day is something of a miracle in this profession. The life of the writer can be a tenuous one, often impossible to make a go of. Our early struggles remind us to be grateful. Which isn't to say that they have schooled us in how to balance everyday, everyday demands with the act of creation. For some of these years in which I drifted, I did not have this problem to wrestle. Back in 2004, after the writing of my first novel, The Second Life of Samuel Time, I got restless. I had spent 18 months drafting the book, which, when you're 23 years old, feels like the equivalent of being made to sit through James Cameron's Titanic for the seventh time. At the end of it, you feel that they should award you the Purple Heart. I was exhausted and looking to reemerge in the world in some grand way. Admittedly, part of my restlessness could have been due to the fact that the novel was written beside a garbage can between the hours of 10 at night and 6 in the morning in the heat of two sweltering Virginia summers. My husband was a graduate student in poetry at the university there and we were both so bitterly poor that the fact that there was any room at all to call my own was like a blessing. Writing beside the garbage meant I didn't have to write in the bedroom with him, which had proved tricky in the past. Poetry is a fiercely language-based discipline, much more so than fiction. I hardly know a poet who doesn't drone on to himself under his breath when writing clicking his T's and popping his consonants. At any rate, between the garbage can, the exhaustion, and the anxiety of writing a novel I was unsure would ever be published, I needed out. But what do you do when your pockets are empty, but you still want a piece of the world? For a long time, nothing. I banged around in my odd jobs, drifted, wrote several openings to novels that didn't gel. Crawling around on the internet one day, I discovered a website called Trans Artists. That site was my undoing for many years. Trans Artists was a database listing almost every artist residency in the world. France, Morocco, Brazil. You just typed in your discipline and the country you were seeking popped up and a whole battery of places that were ready to take in a sorry bum like myself. They provided accommodation, and in some cases, money, to qualified artists. They seemed to offer a chance to experience some of the greater world in a way that would not bankrupt me. I threw my proverbial hat in the ring. From 2004 to 2010, I lived in Scotland, Iceland, Spain, Hungary, Finland, Belgium, and several times in Germany. The accommodations were almost always much more or much less glamorous than expected, but all without exception boasted a fascinating history. In Iceland, in the middle of darkest winter, I lived in the house of the writer Gunnar Gunnarsson on the eastern coast. I had not been familiar with his work before going, but he was in his time a figure of great national import, and around his house a perverse sort of lore had arisen, a fantasist's history. Did you know, people whispered, 
that Gunnar Gunnarsson had been a fascist? And did you know that Hitler actually stayed in one of the upper guest rooms on a secret visit in 42? And that in the very kitchen where you take your dinner, the two men had concocted all sorts of plans on how to best get Scandinavians and Germans to procreate? Did I know that towards the end of that dreadful war, a plane flew over the house and dropped a large package? Inside were Hitler's most trusted keepsakes, for he planned somehow to escape there if he lost. No, those weren't his keepsakes, a second man told me, but his last will and testament, along with diagrammed plans of the bunker that he would die in. No, someone later corrected. In fact, there was no package at all. That is a lie. The stories shifted and changed with each new person I chanced to meet in the grocery store. While every night I retired to the empty cavernous house in which I was the only occupant and double locked the doors. With each tick and creak in the dark, I'd break out in a hot sweat. There was nothing surrounding the house for a good mile, just piles of snow on which the northern lights played like silk. With every hiss outside, I heard the slow drift of Nazi ghosts coming over the fields. The residency that was dearest to me, largely because it gave rise to my second novel, Half-Blood Blues, was a place called Académie Schloss Solitude. It was located in the outbuildings of an 18th century castle atop a hill overlooking the city of Stuttgart. At any given time, it housed about 40 artists, and they hailed from all over the world, none of them over the age of 35. You can imagine what a hotbed this was. 40 young artistic temperaments thrown together, some barely speaking English or German, feeling reckless and unaccountable and rich for the first time in their lives. There was a thousand euro stipend dispensed at the end of every month. It was run by a dark-haired little Frenchman around five feet tall, whose name in his native tongue meant beautiful. Ludicrously well-groomed, he walked the grounds in his suits and ties, encouraging us to wreck the place in the name of art. You can imagine the passions. You can imagine the quarrels. I remember that during World Cup, which we all viewed on huge screens set up on the lawn of the, of the commons, an argument broke out when, watching the Iranian soccer team pray before the match, a man from Munich commented that they were probably saying, Oh Allah, please give us the bomb. An Iranian girl objected to this, but so too did most of the rest of us, the Brazilians in particular raking him over the coals. I remember also being personally scolded by a man from Indonesia for being decadent. This was more a source of fascination to me than anything else. I had bought some large jars of vitamins from the health food store. And one day he came from around a corner when I was taking them and pursed his lips. Those don't work, he said. You are wasting money. Now, I do understand that the health benefits of multivitamins are still unfounded. But what started as a tossed off comment became a crusade to correct my Canadian decadence. I do not know what it is about me that set him off, but everything I did seemed to him a source of moral failing, of some hapless Canadian impulse to be wasteful. Watching me toss an apple core into the compost, his eyes would tighten and his lips would shrink into his mouth like a sudden hole opening in the earth. I do not know what Canada is like, he'd say, letting the comment linger before going on. You could eat more of that apple. I felt harassed, avoiding him until one breezy evening when some of us sat eating a late dinner under the sunset, others lazily smoking nearby. I wasn't really hungry, had already started moving my food around on my plate, but when he sat down, I began to eat greedily, determined to finish everything. We had all been talking of the stipend, of what people were spending it on. For some, it was the banal things, 
food, materials, wine. For others, it was vodka and cocaine. When it came his turn to speak, he became solemn, and I feared he was about to slip into one of his rebukes. He made a helpless gesture with his hands. This money, he said, it is more money than I have ever had in my whole life. In one month, I earn more here than I earn in one year back home. When I leave here, I will have more money than most families can ever hope to earn. He made another gesture which expressed a blistering guilt, a sense of defeat at his own good fortune. All at once, I understood him. He continued to speak, but for me, he did not need to. He had been fighting his entire life for the space to do his work. He was a graphic novelist. And for his entire life, not a single soul had taken that work seriously. He came from a place where the artistic impulse is seen as a form of lunacy. And for years, he had been passionately advocating to be respected. Now that he had that, respect, payment for his work, like-minded friends, all the time in the world to create. He had arrived at what for him was the perfect balance. And he had not written a thing since his arrival six months earlier. It turned out that the perfect balance was the biggest disruption of his life. He did not know if he could survive a year so perfectly designed to his needs. The equilibrium was destroying him. Perhaps that is what happens that a too beautifully balanced life is really a kind of annihilation. Perhaps it is like Wilde's portrait of Dorian Gray, all pleasant and lovely on the surface, but the rot is still going on in a back cupboard somewhere, ready to be uncovered when you least expect it. This does not stop me from trying to reach some kind of equilibrium, but maybe I should be grateful for my shortcomings. At his trial for allegedly corrupting the youth of Greece, Socrates famously uttered, the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. For him, the search for a greater truth and the full expression of that truth were questions of life and death. Faced with exile and the shuddering of his ideas, he chose instead to drink hemlock. Every writing student, when he is starting out, has this phrase lobbed at him at every turn. You hear it so many times from fellow students, from professors in classes that have nothing to do with philosophy, on food packages from enlightened, eco-friendly corporations, that it begins to feel like a mantra. The quote is almost always given glibly like this, lacking a larger context. And among my clique of friends, it came to mean a sort of enslaved devotion to the craft of writing. You had to be willing to give up everything to be a writer. A comfortable middle class salary, a partner, home ownership, even your sanity, if that's what the muse asked of you. We celebrated writers like Charles Bukowski and Raymond Carver, Flannery O'Connor and Simone Weil writers who had destroyed their lives or suffered their destruction and either chose or were forced to live in eccentric ways. Curse all of Flaubert's advice about tidy and mannerly living. Once you elected to spend your life putting pen to paper, all propriety went out the window. You were damned. I confess that such a stance once seemed inevitable to me. I was ready to throw myself on the pyre. I would not have children. I would have no home. But the loss of those things would give me something greater, a kind of personal enlightenment. I would walk the earth in rags, but with a radiant otherworldly knowledge, the modern day version of one of Tolstoy's wandering prophets. And for a time, I led a lesser version of this life. In my 20s, whenever I got deep into a writing project, 
I would go off on something my husband and I called the crash. We got the idea from a speech that the novelist Kazuo Ishiguro gave a few decades ago, in which he talked of going into self-imposed exile when he had to finish a novel. He would travel to a remote place where no one could reach him, turn off his phone. There, he would become a sort of wild man in the wilderness, speaking to no one and simply writing until he finished. Or so we understood it to be. Perhaps it was not so stark, but we tried to approximate it in our own way. Whenever my husband's parents embarked on one of their many trips, one or the other of us would decamp to their house, the other staying in our apartment in the city, both of us shutting off the phone and rebuffing any attempts from the outside world to contact us. We became known for this, but not in any celebrated way. Even as people respectfully kept their distance, you could feel the puzzlement and the pity. Why, when you led such a happy life, would you willingly twist it into something so grotesque? Why shut people out? Why elect not to speak to an actual human being for 10 days? It was unfathomable. We thought it was the sacrifice that you made. It was Rilke's theory of the wasted appendage, the shrunken limb that life becomes when you are creating. We have since rejected that way of thinking. The idea that writers must lead hermetic, self-centered lives in order to create is a damaging fallacy. There are other ways of finding silence inside yourself, ways that don't involve becoming Howard Hughes. It is true that the writer must carve out some time and a space to work, but that does not have to come at the expense of love or children, though it may come at some material expense. It simply requires the acceptance of the notion of balance and a willingness to live in a state of ongoing struggle to achieve it. To finish, I will tell you of another query that I often get when giving talks. The question is, do you think you will ever write about your children? Now, this is a much better question, I think, than the one I recently heard a radio journalist ask a female writer at a function I attended. Lurking weirdly behind her seat, he lurched over her shoulder and stuttered, do you think of your books as your children? I do not believe anyone actually confuses books and children. <laughs> and to those who do, I would say that the books are the ones with the bigger words, in the beginning anyway. I recently finished reading a wonderfully entertaining book a novelist wrote about her son's first year of life. While I enjoyed it immensely, I couldn't help but think about how he would have reacted to that book when he was old enough to read and understand it. While she is mostly positive about the experience of raising him, there is a lot of hand-wringing and distress, and she does not shy from laying out her difficulties. Her son would be 22 years old now. What is his relationship to this portrait of a self that he can in no way remember? I personally would not want my children's lives to be in any way defined or even colored by anything I would write about them. My fictional characters are composites and so necessarily harbor some of the features of those around me, but they will never be depictions of actual people. I want my children to live by their own memories. Just as the people whose traits fleetingly grace my fiction go about their own lives none the wiser that the lilt of their accents, the slant of their jaws, has been pinned down in words, so my own children should never experience the certainty of recognition. Life, after all, belongs to the living, not to art. It is rather the gesture of life, its essential spirit, that we hope to capture when we sit down to write. The likeness of lives that will die out, but whose defining gestures 
a twist of the mouth, a quiet voice, may continue to live on in ink. Thank you very much. for that wonderful, wonderful talk. And um, we do have a few minutes for questions. And after that, uh, I have some uh, thank yous to say. Uh, we have um, an online audience tonight, as uh, Dr. Vargo mentioned. And I'd like to welcome our online participants. Uh, if you are watching online, uh, remember, uh, we're, we're high tech this year. Uh, you can tweet your questions for Essie uh, using hashtag SE Live. Hashtag SE -E Live. And uh, even if you don't have a question to tweet for Essie, you might even wish her a happy birthday because in um, four hours, maybe Victoria time, three hours Saskatchewan time, it's Essie's birthday. Uh, so just wanted to embarrass you and, and mention that. Uh, but uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. We're so fortunate to have you come here. And um, on that note, I, I would open the floor and the, um, the cyber world uh, for, for questions for Essie for maybe 10 minutes or so. And I, I can't really see you, so you'll have to wave. And if you do have a question, I believe there are microphones set up. So if you could please um, ask your, go to a microphone and ask your question, and then um, everyone um, who's watching online can hear your question as well. Questions? Hello. I um, heard you on the radio this morning and enjoyed it very much. I was wondering if you could expand a bit more on the perseverance it takes to be a writer when you were referring to many rejections of this book that won the Geller Prize and um, just for our learning experience. Yeah, sure, of course. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, I spoke briefly about that um, this afternoon. Uh, so, for those of you who were at that talk, bear with me, I'm going to repeat myself. Um, Half-Blood Blues had a very fraught, uh, not even a fraught publication history, but just from, you know, from the point of creation until getting it, you know, out in the world was just so, so fraught and, and wild. Um, so, I started writing the book um, at the end of this residency in Germany. And I had previously written a novel, uh, completed a, a whole novel about a pianist. Um, and this was slated to be my second published work. Uh, but that was rejected across the board. So, um, you know, I was living in Germany and wondering about the history of black people in Germany and then came across the story of um, people like Hieronymus Falk. So, um, you know, the children of white German mothers and Afri African colonial soldiers um, who fought for France um, and were occupying the Rhineland after the, after the First World War, which is just to stuff a history lesson into a single sentence. Um, but, you know, I, I researched that history and got very interested in writing about him and um, started a whole new book and wrote a first draft in 18 months and then redrafted for probably another 18 months and had this, this um, book to, you know, to sell. And it sold in England um, to a small outfit called Serpent's Tale and their wonderful publishing house. Uh, but it failed to find a publisher in Canada. Like, it was just, it made the rounds. Everybody saw it and rejected it. And so, um, in the, you know, at the very end, the 11th hour, uh, a small Canadian house called Key Porter bought it. And we started um, editing it, and we got to this place where we had actually produced advanced reader's copies, which is what you send out to reviewers uh, prior to the book actually coming out so that they can, you know, they can pitch it or, you know, give some commentary on it. 
and uh, then the publishing house went bankrupt. So it was just, it was mad. And uh, luckily I managed to get my rights back so I could attempt to resell the book somewhere else. And so it made the rounds a second time and again was rejected flatly by everyone uh, in the very state that it was published in eventually. It was exactly the same manuscript. And uh, finally my husband who had just published a novel with uh, Thomas Allen, convinced his editor to have another look at it. And that editor had also previously seen it uh, and had been unconvinced by my agent to look at it again, but was convinced enough by my husband, whose opinion he respected, to have another look. And he, he loved the new version and he bought it immediately and he rushed it in, into print and into, um, you know, published it within six months kind of thing. But miraculously, um, during that whole time, uh, the book was still slated to come out in England. And I guess the first review of it, which ran in The Guardian, which is a very influential tastemaker, uh, gave it a mixed review. So this was not a good thing. So, you know, I, was, I thought, this is terrible. This is just a, a crash and burn situation. But then the Booker long list came out, and it seems like that was where my fortunes completely turned. And, and as I said this morning, you know, people who had said this book is, uh, I got so many interesting rejections. I remember a Dutch publisher who had published my previous novel said that this novel was, she said it was too male and that men don't read. So books about men are not great. And that it was too black, which, you know, as a Canadian, you sort of wince at that. I thought, what? It's too black? I don't know. How do I make it less black? <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, it was kind of gratifying that it did so well after, after it having such troubles. And it's, you know, it just completely boggles the mind. I have no idea about this industry. It just seems like, I, I think essentially the, the main advice I would give is just to keep persevering and to write what you would like to write and uh, get it in its best shape possible and just believe in it and, and see what happens. So, hello. I was wondering how, uh, kind of flipping it around, instead of talking about the writing process, talking about your reading process. When you read a book, is there something that you find continually grabs you some element of literature that you're always hooked by, like the way words fit or the specific parts of a narrative or how they they fit together that you find affects your writing? Can you understand any? Sorry, no, I can't hear you very well okay. for some reason. I will mumble less. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in the process of reading uh, literature, if there's any element that you find continually grabs you when you go to something or holds your attention that you find affects uh, your writing in a substantive way? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, it's this interesting thing where when I'm in the middle of writing a book, I find that I can't stand anybody else's books. Like, I just, you know, I think, oh, this will be a great read, and I pick it up, I read 10 pages, and I think, oh, this is garbage. But really what's happening is I just, you know, at the point of um, creation, it's almost like you can't really be, um, yeah, very receptive to other people's words. So I, I tend to read a lot of nonfiction when I'm actually writing a book, um, or else fiction, you know, where there's some kind of um, uh, point of research in it for me. Uh, and it's really in between books that I do most of my, my reading. And what I tend to read for is, you know, I'm, I'm very easy. I'll, I will read about any subject matter so long as, you know, the sentences are well crafted and everything's, you know, just on a, on a basic sentence and paragraph level. If the writer can put those together really well, and in an engaging way, not just kind of a workaday uh, good, but actually brilliant and idiosyncratic. And I mean, it doesn't have to be out there. It can be the most straightforward sentences as possible, but just, you know, something compelling about the way they're putting their language together. Uh, and also structure as well, because I think structure is 
it, you know, it's one of these things that nobody really talks too much about, but it's, it's that hidden thing that, um, you know, that really pulls somebody through a book or through a novel. Like, you don't realize it's working on you, but when somebody has structured something in a way that constantly creates a question within you of, you know, what's going to happen next, um, that is a well-structured novel. And it, I don't mean that it has to be plot-based. Uh, I'm not sort of advocating, you know, that everything have a very strong plot, but just even to create, you know, a character that you care a lot about and, you know, maybe they, there's the sense of, you know, they're going to see their son for the first time in, you know, in, in several years or, you know, just these questions that come up, these very humane things that keep you reading. It's good to hear. I hope I'll be understood. Um, we talked about this earlier this afternoon, and you touched the question or the, the topic in your speech. So, how was the book received in Germany? Because we, we discussed this that they totally changed the title to make it yes. a little more appealing or less provoking. So, mm -hmm. how was actually the reception? Yeah, I mean, I did not physically go to Germany to promote the book. Um, it was such a hairy time, I just, mm -hmm. I could not do any more traveling at that point. Um, but I did get a lot of feedback from the German publisher and, um, you know, people would send me sort of pictures of, there was one, I think the main English language bookstore there, you know, papered their entire window with the book cover and, you know, had stacks of books and it was a real celebration. And yeah, it seemed to go over very well there, which I was, um, I think, like when we spoke, I was very nervous about the reception there um, for obvious reasons, but it, it went over very well. Uh, the one thing that you, you did mention was that uh, they did change the title in German. I mean, they changed it in, I think the title was different probably in most of the, the countries, um, I guess most European countries, the, the title was slightly shifted. I think in, in France it was, um, I can't remember the title in French, but the German title ended up being Play It Again. And I really resisted that particular title because it, first of all, it's the last line of the book. Uh, and, you know, second of all, I, you know, I didn't sort of like this Casablanca um, sort of insinuations of it. And, uh, you know, we, we had a bit of a, you know, a struggle over this, but in the end, you know, they were very adamant that they could not use the title Half-Blood Blues because to translate the, um, the term Half-Blood into German and to have that be on a book cover would have been extremely shocking uh, for a German audience. It was just, uh, the translation is something that you know, would come off as very insulting. And, um, and so I, you know, I was very, you know, I understand that fully and very respectful of that. Hello, again. Um, I am wondering, I, I've read a lot of books about writing, um, and I feel like sometimes I paralyze myself by reading more and not actually writing. Um, and so I wonder, um, a lot of them have said that um, you, you must focus on the character. Think of a character and start developing the character, and then the character will live out their life for you. They'll basically write the book for you. And so I wonder, um, my, my struggle is I feel like I must know where I'm going. Like I must have some sense of something. Like, and so I, I just wonder if you can speak to that and tell me where you start. I know, I know this one specifically uh, stemmed from a curiosity of kind of black history or um, involvement in that, you know, place and time. But but how does it normally work for you? Yeah, um, for me it generally does start with character, but I mean I don't want to be you know, a grand advocate for that way of, of creating. I think that it's all to do with your personal philosophy of writing and, and what you think fiction should be doing. Um, I mean there are some writers who, you know, their characters feel very distant and cold and it's all about the sense of mood or, um, you know, the sense of time and place, and those are very legitimate concerns and legitimate ways of writing as well. Um, personally, I'm, I've always been very interested in, in the 
the people in fiction, in the life of fiction. And um, yeah, just the, the chance to explore a character or create people who are you know, so wildly different from myself or, or you know, from the people who are close to me or you know, even bearing traits of the people close to me, like this is very exciting for me to, to do that and, and to, to feel like I'm you know, attempting to craft a fully formed person. Like, this is the most exciting thing for me. Um, that said, uh, I mean, characters, the characters that come to you basically arise from, from so many different places. Like my interest in the history of black people in Germany, I mean, that's, that's not a character, but that's, you know, that's uh, research, doing the research into, into that history and into the history of black people in Germany, in particular in the Second World War, um, you know, this, this led me to create somebody who would have existed in that time. But, you know, getting to him was a process uh, that was completely different. And I did write a lot of sketches that were just, you know, trying to get a feel for the setting of Berlin or the setting of, of you know, even of Baltimore, uh, you know, without really knowing who I was writing about. And, you know, if you saw first drafts of Half-Blood Blues, um, you know, you would think even somebody like Sid doesn't really feel like Sid. Like it, it sort of takes, takes a while for these people to, to get fully fleshed out. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of different angles you could come at it from. Yeah. Hi. Um, um, Half Blood Blues has a major musical component to it, and I was wondering if there's a particular reason you chose as the, as music as a specific reason that that the whole that the novel was based around it, or was it just more? Of, is it more of a passion, or is there? <laughs> Yeah, so there were various, um, various things I was interested in or threads that I was interested in braiding together in this novel and one was my interest in the history of black people in Germany but another one was my interest uh, you know, that I've had since I was a teenager in the Weimar Republic and the art uh, that emerged from that, that brief time in mm -hmm. history uh, which was basically following the First World War, uh, this great flowering of art um, in, in Germany and in Berlin in particular, uh, in which people were, you know, painting the craziest things and, you know, cabaret and, you know, you think of all of those, all of those things that define that era. Uh, but, you know, I always had a sense of, um, you know, uh, like Josephine Baker, um, really admiring her and being very interested in her life and knowing that she was one of those artists who felt very limited uh, in, the, in the United States and went over to Paris to live a sort of freer life. And that this was, uh, this was a trend back then. Uh, I think a lot of African American artists and musicians in particular, performers and musicians, uh, felt you know, like they just could not really apply their trade and couldn't have any freedom in their lives under Jim Crow law. And so they traveled abroad, and they went to Paris, and they went to Berlin, and they were, um, you know, were celebrated there, as Professor McNeil was saying. Like they were, you know, they were the rock stars of the era. And so, yeah, just this idea of, of jazz musicians uh, going over was so attractive to me. And of course, you know, as a lover of the music, it seemed like a no-brainer to, to have that as my central thing. Or you can always ask me when, when we're out signing. Don't feel obligated if you're a little bit shy. Well, uh, I think at this point, um, I will say some thank yous. And, uh, uh, we also have uh, something for you, Essie. Uh, an event like this requires a team effort. I would acknowledge the following people for making tonight's special event possible. We're grateful to the College of Arts and Science, the Department of English, and the MFA in Writing Program for their sponsorship of this important event. The Arts and Science Book Club Selection Committee for their work in bringing our distinguished guest, 
Essie Igudjian to the University of Saskatchewan. We also acknowledge the Saskatoon Jazz Society and the Saskatchewan Jazz Festival for their support in promoting this year's book club and My Writing Life lectures. Thank you to Dean McNeil and the U of S Jazz Ensemble for their wonderful performance. Thanks to the University of Saskatchewan Centre for continuing and distance education for their sponsorship of live streaming of tonight's lecture and to our media production team for their technical support. Thanks to the University of Saskatchewan Bookstore for facilitating tonight's book sales. For those of you who'd like to purchase a book, and I hope you will, Essie will be happy to sign it for you um, in the Education Lounge right after this during the reception. Special thank you to the regional college students and their advisors, the senior citizen learners, and the students in Saskatoon who were part of many book clubs leading up to this special day. To everyone at our regional colleges watching this event live tonight, thank you for joining us here at Quant's Theatre. Thank you to the College of Arts and Science Communications and Events Office for their work on this event. We especially thank Essie for agreeing to be this year's College of Arts and Science Book Club author and sharing her work and writing life with us. And um, you, just this afternoon and tonight, you've, you've just been so generous and um, thank you for your wonderful, wonderful words. And uh, we have a small token uh, for you. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much. We take a, maybe they'll take a picture of us. <laughs> Photo off. <laughs> thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you again. And uh, before we uh, give a final round of applause uh, to Essie, uh, I'd like to invite everyone to join us in the Education Lounge for the reception, book signing, and more great music from the U of S Jazz Ensemble. Uh, can we please have a final round of thanks for Essie? <laughs>